there. So again, we're gonna call today week one of our series, The Seven Dimensions of Discipleship. If you weren't here last week, I set up this series talking about the importance of discipleship, what it is and, and what it should be in our lives. We are called to be disciples and make disciples by Jesus in Matthew 28, 19, the beginning of what is called the Great Commission says this, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. Jesus didn't say, therefore go and make converts, although we believe in evangelism and people getting saved, that's kind of the point, but Jesus goes further and says, don't, don't just go for someone to raise a hand or recite a salvation prayer. Go and make disciples. And we also talked about who he was saying this command to. He was talking to his disciples, telling disciples to make disciples, which leads us into our, our running definition this, for this series of the word disciple, and it's this. We're gonna define disciple as someone who is following Jesus, being changed by Jesus, and committed to the mission of Jesus which is disciple making. So again, it's someone who is following Jesus. This person is being changed by Jesus. We are growing in him and we are committed to the mission of Jesus. I talked last week about how, in my opinion, everything that's going wrong in the world right now, we know that there is an evil in this world. We know that Satan does have a plan for this world, but there's never any scripture in the entire Bible that ever says that toward the end and as time goes on, that evil will grow stronger. What it says is that the faith of many will grow weaker. I think what we're seeing in the world is not evil getting stronger, but Christians not being discipled and sticking with the mission of Jesus. So this entire series, these seven dimensions, Holy Spirit, generosity, mission, worship, prayer, service, and Bible, what we're gonna do the entire series, because this can be overwhelming, because I can paint the picture for what a true disciple of Jesus Christ looks like, the end game, and for many people that could be intimidating. But how could I ever become that? So in this series, what we're gonna be doing, why we have this staircase, is I'm not asking people to become the Apostle Paul tomorrow. I don't think the Bible commands us to be a perfect disciple tomorrow, but what we're gonna be asking every week in this series, based on every topic we're doing, with that specific topic, can you just take your next step? What's your next step in growth in all of these categories? So we come up to this and we're where we are now, we're addressing where we are now as a disciple, as a believer, and we're looking at this next step of growth. And here we're looking at it thinking, well, what, what if I could be that? I, I think I, I want to grow. I've never met a Christian ever. I've never had a conversation with a Christian where I said, hey, do you want to grow in your faith? And they go, no. <laughs> I've never met a Christian that said that. No, I'm good. I'm basically like Jesus. I'm great. No, everyone wants to grow. But very few people do, why? Because it's all about the next step. Up there can be daunting, but right here is doable. I can do this, and once I'm here, I can, I can do the next step. So what is your next step in growth in discipleship? Today we're gonna to be talking about the topic of worship, and it's actually one of our core values. One of our core values here at the church is we passionately worship. And I've titled my message today, Made to worship. We were made to worship. I mean, some of us, when I talk about, sometimes people ask me what we're gonna do in heaven, and we're gonna worship, and I remember being little, and someone telling me that, and be like, so all we're gonna do is worship? Be like, yeah. Like, so can you explain to me what happens in hell again? Because I, you know, like, because all I'm picturing is having to stand up, stand up for eternity in worship as a little kid, but one, one of the things I want us to get today is this, and understanding what worship really is. What is it really? Is it what we just did a few minutes ago, singing? Absolutely it's that, and it's so much more. I wanna show you a few quotes from just some, some more prominent, famous writers talking about worship, writers and theologians. A.W. Tozer, one of my favorite authors ever, said this, we must never rest until everything inside us worships God. We, we must never rest until everything inside of us worships God. C.S. Lewis said this, 
It is in the process of being worshiped that God communicates his presence to men. It's in the process of worship that we experience the true presence of God. He also said, the New Testament does not speak of solitary religion. A regular assembly for worship is everywhere in the epistles. The concept of worship in the New Testament never coincides with the idea that I don't need church, I don't need the corporate gathering, I just like worshiping God in nature, going on a hike, just me and God. That can be a godly thing to do if we're not forsaking the assembling of ourselves because there's something powerful about corporate worship, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. I love this quote also from the writer James K.A. Smith. He says, worship is the arena in which God recalibrates our hearts, reforms our desires, and rehabituates our loves. Worship isn't just something we do. Worship isn't just something we do. It is where God does something to us. Worship is the heart of discipleship because, because it is the gymnasium in which God retrains our hearts. Why is it part of the discipleship process? Because when you are in the presence of God, you are growing. When you are in tune with God, when you are blessing God, when you are glorifying God, you are growing. Yes, worship is about him, but what I love about God so much is when we follow his commands, all of them, we at the same time benefit from just obeying. And he says, worship me. And when we do with our whole hearts, we grow. Every week in this series, every topic, I'm gonna give us some benchmarks or goals of, of what a growing disciple looks like according to this topic. And these goals we're actually gonna be putting on our resource page on our website for this series for today. So if you don't have enough time to write them down or take photos, these are pretty important to hang on to though. A few of these goals are things like this. Disciples, when it comes to worship, actively worship God in private moments and with their local church community and choose to worship even when circumstances and emotions bring great distractions. Another one is disciples offer worship to God with deep respect and continually grow in their knowledge of God's character and nature. Disciples grow in obedience to God and draw closer to God and each other, exemplifying God's characteristics regularly through words, actions, and attitudes. Now it's starting to show us what the outcome of worship is. And the last one on here is disciples find their full identity in Jesus Christ and express gratitude, experiencing God's healing from the past and fresh hope for the future. So much of worship is the discipline of learning to be grateful to God. Putting the blessing on God and not only letting blessing be a one-way street, but us turning around and blessing God. So what is your next step with worship? Worship is what we did a few minutes ago singing songs, but what is your next step? It goes far beyond that, it is that and more. What's your next step? Looking at those standards, those goals, where do we measure up? So today I wanna look at three questions revolving around the idea of worship, and the first one is this. When it comes to worship, simply what is it? So I've kind of just been tiptoeing around it, but what is worship? The general definition of the word is this. It's our response to what we value the most. That's what worship is. Our response to what we value the most. But let's zero in a little bit more specific. What is biblical worship? Biblical worship is this, an act of assigning ultimate value to God in a way that engages our entire being. I wanna read it again, let it soak in. Biblical worship is an act of assigning ultimate value to God in a way that engages our entire being. So if we've given ultimate value to someone or something else, it's about removing it from that and with our entire being, pointing that value back to God and worshiping him with our life. I'll give you an example. Psalm 95, one through seven is King David. I'm gonna be reading from the Amplified Version and it says this. 
This is known as one of the most classic worship psalms, um, passages in the entire Bible. Oh, come, let us sing joyfully to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with a song of thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with songs. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In whose hand, in whose hand are the depths of the earth, the peaks of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it by his command, and his hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, in reverent praise and prayer. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will listen to his voice. This is a powerful passage on defining what worship is. It's worship with our entire being. David is writing with an entire being mindset. In this passage, he's engaging his entire being using his mind, will, and emotion. He's engaging his entire being. What is our entire being? It's our mind, it's our will, and it's our emotions. How does David use these in scripture? Let's go in order here, um, starting in verse one. It shows how David uses his emotion in worship. I mean, he's singing, right? It says, oh, come, let us sing joyfully to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. We, we know in, in other stories in scripture, David was such a, a wild worshiper that there was a story of him taking his clothes off, coming into the city, worshiping God as the Ark of the Covenant came in. That is a weird story, guys. I mean, it's okay. Sometimes you just read stuff in the Bible and you go, I don't know what I would do if someone did that in church today. It would just, that would be pretty awkward, right? But he was an extravagant, emotional worshiper. I think it's astonishing how many churches, how many denominations actually teach and against and look down on emotional worship. There are churches everywhere you walk in and it looks like during the song time of worship that everyone there would rather be anywhere but there during worship. Yeah. I mean, the songs are going about how Jesus is awesome and the joy of the Lord, and they're sitting there like, we've been taught we can't raise our hands. We've been taught we can't use emotion because emotion, for some reason, is uncontrollable and it's bad. I don't see that in Scripture. I see worship being a pretty emotional thing. I see worship just like in this passage where there's the joy of the Lord. There are tears sometimes that, that stream during worship. Sometimes people do dance. There, there's this, this outward expression of what's happening on the inside. When you think about music, I mean, music is a massive part of worship all through Scripture. That's why we do it every single week in church. From the Old Testament and the New Testament, they gathered and through music and song, they worshiped God, and we do too. And how we worship physically is a part of the growth process of taking the next step. And you go, I, I just don't, I don't know about that. I, I, I challenge you, try to find one passage in the entire Bible that talks about worship where there isn't a physical demonstration of what's happening on the inside with our spirit before God. It, it's, it's all about taking what's in here and David said, I want praise to forever be on my lips. People are playing drums, they're singing, they're shouting, they're lifting their hands. Why? Because music should move us. All music moves us. I mean, you think about it. I was watching this movie the other day. Um, this is the newest King Arthur movie with my um, daughter and her boy, my oldest daughter and her boyfriend. And it's a, it's a great movie, but I work out to the soundtrack of that movie. It's the weirdest thing ever. But we got to this one part, and I looked at Avery. I was like, Avery, Jaden, look, this is when I'm doing bench. I'm like, this like, boom, 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 boom. And I'm, I'm doing this, and they're laughing at me. Like, I, I, it's the weirdest thing ever. But we all work out to music, because if you go to the gym and work out, and you forget your headphones, you forget your AirPods, you're walking in going, experience of the gym ruined. Why? Because we are moved by music, but so many people refuse to be moved by it in church. Well, because that's not, that's not spiritual, but it's emotional which means it's spiritual because God gave us our emotions. The other part, the other angle of this that David worships, the second part of his entire being is the will. It says, oh come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker in reverent praise 
and prayer. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. What, what's amazing about worship, this is our moment when we're singing songs or when we're in our car and we're listening to worship music or whatever, wherever we are and we're worshiping. This is our opportunity to have a posture in our life of bowing before God in submission to God. I know people today hate that word submission, but it's the best word ever because it means under the mission. I want to live my life under sub the mission of God. That's what a disciple does. And someone who's in submission to God comes into worship with a certain reverence toward God. We never should take it casually. We can dress casually when we come to church. We can have fun on the stage. We can have lights. We can have these things. But in our spirit, are we taking that time casually? Do, do, we, ever, do we ever engage in meaningful worship outside of church? Or are we losing sight of the reverence of God and also the will of deciding? So many of these steps, which you're gonna hear for the next few weeks, it, it, it's not something that God does to you or for you. It's something you just have to decide. It's the will. I'm gonna decide to grow and take the next step. For many people, I've said this before when I've taught on worship, I mean, all growing up through high school and college and even early in my ministry years, I was not a hand raiser in church. I wasn't. They would say, lift your hands, and I was like, eh, I don't know. It's just kind of, I kind of feel weird about it, you know? Until I married a worshiper. And then she was like, why do you look like you hate your life on the front row? You're supposed to be one of the pastors of the church. And but, you know, like that kind of stuff. But honestly, it was the most freeing thing when I allowed worship to come out of my spirit and out of the inner part of my, of my body, out of my body, where I'm worshiping with my lips and my hands. Because when I do this physically everywhere in life, when someone does this, it's a sign of surrender and openness. This is a vulnerable sign. That's why police say, raise your hands, right? because so they can see your hands, but also you're the vulnerable one and they're not. When we raise our hands, what we're saying to God is I am opening myself up, mind, body, and spirit to you. So when someone says, lift your hands, it's not like I'm not gonna do what they tell me to do. I'm just gonna go, you know what? I may have forgotten and today I'm gonna take my next step and I'm gonna lift my hands in worship. Well, I'm not a hand lifter. Well, why? Scripture says to do it. Lift your hands, shout for joy. Well, I'm not a shouter, neither am I. But yesterday I was shouting like crazy at the TV for a football game, and I looked over at Mandy and I was like, oh man, now I've got to shout tomorrow in church because, <laughs> because I, I'm assigning ultimate value back to God. It's the will, and then thirdly on this part, it's the mind, emotion, will, mind. And it says this in verse seven, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand today, if you will listen to his voice. When was the last time in worship you tuned everything out when we're singing or in your car and you tune out the radio, you tune out the sports, you tune out all the different things and you're listening to worship music and you're engaging your mind saying, God, speak to me as I bless you. I'm engaging my mind. I'm imagining myself in the throne room of God. I am kneeling before you. So it is the emotion, the will, and the mind. Now, if any of these three if we go overboard on any of these three, we're no longer worshiping with our entire being. Because I said a few minutes ago, a wor worship can be emotional, but it can't be all emotional because that isn't worship. You gotta reel that in a little bit. It can't be all the mind or it's too cerebral and everything in worship is inside, but David said, get it out and it should forever be on your lips, right? It can't be all the will or basically you're forcing yourself to worship God every single day, and that means you have, we have a heart issue, right? It's gotta be all three at play, all the time, working on it, one step at a time, growing to worship God the way he desires to be worshiped. So remember, the definition of biblical worship is the act of assigning ultimate value to God in a way that engages our entire being. So let me ask you, ultimate value, I, I think we need to appraise our relationship with God. We, we need to revalue or reevaluate our relationship with God when it comes to worship. Where is worship at on your priority list? And I'm gonna explain the benefits in the next couple of minutes, but where is it today? Where, what step are you on when it comes to those goals and targets and benchmarks where we're supposed to be? We need to appraise it because when we appraise God again, the outcome will be worship because we realize who he truly is and we realize his true value. I'll, I'll give you um, an example. 
Let, let's say there's this woman who has this beautiful necklace, jewels, beautiful. And all she knows about it is it's worth something, but it's been passed down in her family for so many generations, nobody really knows where it came from or its true value. I mean, she doesn't even keep it locked up. It's just kind of in the top drawer at the house or, or whatever it might be. And, and she'll kind of throw it around or put it on for something nice and then kind of forget about it. But one day she's looking at it and just says, you know what, today I'm gonna take it to a jeweler, this thing I've kind of taken casually and I want to appraise it. So she takes it to a jeweler and she says, can you appraise this? And she's standing at the desk with this jeweler and he takes out the, the, the jeweler's lens, the loop, and, he, and he's looking into the jewels and looking into the necklace and he's, he's watching how the light is reflecting off of all the angles of the jewels and he's looking at the quality, the density, the size, and all of these different things, the craftsmanship and how it was made. And all of a sudden the woman looks at the jeweler and she can see sweat beads starting to form on the man's forehead and he all of a sudden has labored, breathing, looking at this because this man, as he's analyzing the necklace, begins to understand this immense value the immense value of what this woman possessed. He looks at the craftsmanship and, and, and starts to analyze it and goes, this, this is a lost art of making jewelry. This is an ancient piece of jewelry that has been passed down somehow. They no longer even make jewelry like this. Some of these stones don't even exist anymore. And he looks up to her and says, this is worth so much. It's entering into the realm of priceless. He says, it's millions and millions. She walks into the jewelry store just carrying it casually in her purse. But she walks out of the jewelry store, carrying it in a locked box that she buys from the jeweler, walking out like it's the most precious thing she's ever encountered, because it is. That's what worship can do for us when it comes to reevaluating who God is. We enter into worship, and it's like walking into that jewelry store and reanalyzing again the true value of who he is and his role in our lives. And every week we need to walk out of church and walk out of the presence of God saying, I know the true value. He is precious to me and I'm gonna worship with my entire being, my entire being. <laughs> Number two is this, when it comes to worship, why should we? Why should we worship? So what is it? And then number two, why should we? The quick answer is this, because we're all already worshiping something. Everybody is worshiping something. Now, I want you to think about this. The world is not divided into people who worship and people who don't. The world is not divided that way. The world is divided into people who worship God and people who worship something else as God. We're all worshiping, so why should we worship? Well, the quick answer is because we're all already worshiping something, so the true key is to move, transfer the worship to wrong things back to the right thing. It's, it's super simple, but it's easier said than done. Louis Giglio says this, when we ask the question of how, Louis Giglio, an amazing pastor and church leader, says it's easy. You simply follow the trail of your time your affection, your energy, your money, and your allegiance. At the end of that trail, you'll find a throne, and whatever or whoever is on that throne is what's of highest value to you. On that throne is what you worship. So what are you worshiping? We all worship something. Now the knee-jerk reaction of everyone who carries the title of Christian, the knee-jerk reaction is to say, well, I worship God. But is he really at the end of that trail of your time, affection, money, talent? Is he really at the end of that trail of where we spend the most of these things, where we give the most of our energy? It's such a challenging question for me and for you, but we're all worshiping something. But why, let's ask this, why do we need to worship God specifically. Number one is this, because worshiping God honors God. Worship honors God. In Psalm 34, another Psalm that David is writing, talking about worship, he says this, I will bless or extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. 
I will glory or boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. It says, I will bless the Lord at all times. Now, sometimes when we read scripture, you kind of think, well, I'll just skip over. I don't understand what that means. I'm just gonna skip over it. I've always kind of wanted to know growing up, how can I bless God? He has everything. He is everything. How can I bless God? But so much of this is tied to what the word bless or blessing really means in specific passages. The reason why I left that word extol there is because this word bless means this. I will give honor to, I will revere God, I will point everything back in his direction because I know everything is because of him, everything comes from him, everything is about him, and I'm going to bless him by giving him the reverence, giving him the respect he deserves. One commentator said this, the word bless, especially in the Old Testament in these Psalms, it, the closest thing we would know of this today is like a military salute. A military salute is something where an inferior officer will salute his or her superior, and when that salute happens, what they're saying is this, I recognize your place, and I recognize mine. I respect your office, but I recognize also my place is below you. When we bless the Lord with worship, what we're doing is reminding ourselves, really, yeah. I'm not God. Yeah. I'm saluting God with my worship, saying, I bless you today. I give emphasis back to you because the natural gravitational pull for all of us when it comes to life is to make us the center. It just is. Every single week in worship, every time we get in our car if we choose to, as we live our day, working on creative ways to worship, we can constantly remind ourselves, I'm aware of my place, but I'm even more aware of his. I'm going to bless God. Worship honors God, and we can't take it casually. We just can't. The second part of this, why do we need to worship God specifically? Worship changes us. So the first part is worship honors God. But again, God is so amazing, he gives us benefits just from the things that he expects from us. Worship changes us. Now there's so many examples I could give of this, and I've talked about this before, but I wanna go specifically into this and show you in scripture what I mean. I wanna take the topic of anxiety for a moment. I do believe, I've said, I, every time I talk about anxiety or depression, I have to, or mental health in general, I have to preface it by saying I absolutely believe there are clinical diagnoses of these. I have battled anxiety and depression in my life. I believe there is a spiritual battle tied to it, but in many cases there's also a physical battle chemical battle tied to it, I believe those things, but what I wanna show you is this. I believe, I believe that the vast majority of anxiety, depression, loneliness, comes back to a lack of worship, or not the lack of worship, but the wor active worship of the wrong thing. And I'm gonna show you why. Let's look at this real quick. Philippians 4, six through seven says, don't be anxious. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and what? Praises shape your worries into prayer. I think this is interesting. A lot of people lose sight of this. The Bible commands us to not be anxious. It never coddles us in our anxiety. It says, don't be anxious. We're like, whoa, that's a little strong, don't you think? Don't be anxious. But what I love about it is it doesn't give us this command without the cure. It says, don't be anxious, but instead let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers. But oftentimes we let our worries shape our prayers and praises. But God's saying, nope, let your praises shape your worry and anxiety. Let it remold what's going on in our minds. The word anxious here in scripture is from the Greek word merimna, and it means this, broken, divided, or shaking. So what the apostle Paul is saying is, don't be broken, don't be divided, don't be shaken or shaking. Hebrews 12, 28, though, says this, therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be what? Shaken. Let us show gratitude or worship and offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and 
awe. What this is saying is when you look at Philippians and to Hebrews, understanding what the word anxious means, what he's saying is this, the reason why the apostle Paul can say, don't be anxious, the reason why with someone like me that battles with anxiety, why I view myself as someone who battles it and conquers it, not as someone who accepts it as my identity and gives into it, the reason I can do that is because I live in the kingdom that cannot be shaken. I live in the kingdom that cannot be shaken. And when I enter into worship, I promise you, when I enter into worship, the anxiety begins to subside because I'm letting praise shape my worry. I promise you, debilitating anxiety cannot exist in the presence of God. Get in to the presence of God. Change what you listen to in your car. Focus your mind, will, and emotions in worship services. Learn what it means with our entire being everywhere we go, not to give in to the way the world thinks, but to enter into the way God thinks in his presence. Number three is this. When it comes to worship, how can we grow in it? So th this is where I, I was talking to my wife, Mandy, yesterday, and of all seven of the topics, worship can get very practical, but it's the least practical, I believe, of the seven. Because the, the, the mostly the tangible thing we see is this 15 or 20 minutes on Sunday, and it's hard for us to wrap our minds around what worship is out there. So I'm gonna give, you, give it my best shot to give you some extremely practical examples of how we can take our next step in worship everywhere we go. So number one, take your next step with consistent worship. With consistent worship. How? By increasing the frequency of church attendance or small group attendance. You're like, oh, come on. This is just the pastor saying he wants us to come to church more. No, I want you to think about the world, the place the world is in. I want you to think about the state of your family, the worries you have for your kids, your grandkids. And if we believe all of this, did you know that the average churchgoer now only attends between two and four weeks? Or uh, yeah, between... Um, one or two weeks a month at church. That's the average in America. And, and so we're, we're only down to an hour and 10 minute service anyways. And if we're not making that the highest priority, coming and gathering together with other believers and worshiping, getting our kids into kids ministry, our teenagers into youth ministry, we're missing out. For some people, it's this casual attendance going, why isn't this God thing working? Because you're on the floor. We've got to take the next step. We, we've got it. So let's just take the first practical step. I'm gonna increase church attendance. Get into small groups. Do, do something where the priorities of where you spend your time begins to shift in our everyday life. The next part on this is increase frequency of volunteering on serve teams. Church should never be something we just come and receive. It's a community where we come and we receive and we give. We serve. We, we don't have the, the highest demands ever on serving. Most of the areas where you can serve, you can decide how often, most of them. And so all I'm asking is, if you're a churchgoer and this is your church home, are, am I someone that just comes and receives from everyone else? Or am I someone that comes and receives, but also at some point, I, I think I wanna give back and serve some people because I have been served for a long time. For some of us, it's just getting on a serve team. For, for some of us who are on a serve team, the next step is I, I, wanna, I wanna start leading a team. For some of us, you're already leading, but your next step of growth is I wanna lead a small group. I wanna lead an alpha. I, 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 wanna, I wanna lead an alpha in my, in my workplace. I wanna lead a small group in my workplace. Whatever it might be, there's a next step for everyone. Another part under consistent worship is prioritizing worship events. We have prayer and worship nights all through um, the year. We have conferences. We call, I call those worship events. Flourish is coming up, our women's conference. Worship is through the roof. Every time I come in here at, worship, or at Flourish, I'll stand in the top and I watch in the presence of God. I watch a packed auditorium where, where women are just crying and receiving from God and in, with joy worshiping God. And there's so much healing because we're connected together. Get into worship events. Our minds are focused. We have one this Wednesday here and in Maui, here and in Maui, here this Wednesday, 6.30 p.m. I want you to be here. I want you to prioritize it. You're like, oh my gosh, he's gonna be looking if we're here, but we already had this, ugh, something planned. Guys, 
No one's taking attendance. I just want you here. Remember what I said, in this campus, we have a worship event going on for our kids as well that is gonna be unbelievable. It's an all ages experience. In Maui, the worship night there is at 6 p.m. for English and at 7.30 p.m. for Spanish. It's going to be incredible, a time of healing. We want you guys there. Prioritize worship events. The second part of this, take your next step with corporate worship. I've hit on this a little bit, I'll go quickly. Move from the first step for many of us, many of us, like what it was for me 10 years ago. Move from worship being this, I promise I'm worshiping with my whole heart, but it just looks like I don't wanna be here, you know, promise. Move from this to. <laughs> I'm making stuff up. Move from that to this, or then from here, and then, you know, the first level of hand raising is kinda of like, I don't really want my wife to know yet I'm raising my hands, because I'm just gonna do this, like. When the worship leader says, raise your hand, you're like, I see, you know, whatever it is. But what, in all seriousness, though, there's just something about letting what's on the inside come out. Let it come out. Move from internal worship to external worship. The next part of this, I'm preaching to the choir on this one. Try to learn the lyrics to some of these songs. <laughs> Guys, I, I promise you, I'm such a hypocrite with this, but because I'm trying. But I mean, if I don't know the words, I'm on the, you know, sitting on the front, because when I close my eyes, I just go for it. I'm just like, blah, blah, blah. I'll sing worship songs around the house, and Mandy will like come in and go, Dustin, that is not even close to what the song is. Like, not even close. But I'm trying. I, I, want, I want the words, not just how I feel. That's important how I feel. But I also want the truth, the, the, the scriptural truth in those songs to sink into my heart and change me. Another part of corporate worship is spiritually prepare for Sunday worship. I have here, I, I wanna say, say it like this. We say this to our staff. Sunday starts on Saturday night. Right. I'm looking where our staff is on Saturday night. I'm just looking. I mean, nothing happens. I'm not firing anybody because they're out on Saturday night, but I'm just looking. Because if they're gonna be out until one in the morning on a Saturday night and come in here dragging and not leaders on Sunday morning, we've got a problem. Yeah. Because I believe if this is a priority, right. we need to start prioritizing it at like 5 p.m. on Saturday. Because if I'm coming in here hungover from something Saturday night, I'm like, I don't know what's wrong with me. I, don't, I can't even focus on God this morning. Like, well, you were getting wasted last night. Try to not do that, right? Okay, so I, I think prioritizing this means prioritizing and preparing as we come in. Next part. Is it okay if we just have a little bit of fun like that? The next part. Make sure our kids are involved as much as they can be. Gosh, get your kids involved, involved in every aspect as often as they can at youth on Tuesday nights, coming on sun Sunday mornings. Don't be the parent that says, my teenager won't just, they just won't come. They're your teenager. Get them here. Oh, they're gonna hate it even more if I make them come. Yes, until that one day where the Holy Spirit snags their hearts and says, today's the day. Number three, how do we do it? Take your next step with creative worship. Creative worship. Consider how you start the day. How you start the day is everything when it comes to our relationship with God, for me, practically speaking. If I'm getting up in the morning and I'm like, this is gonna be the worst day ever, it will. If I'm getting up in the morning and I'm not prioritizing God in the morning, every single morning, the very first thing I have to listen to or it just, doesn't mess, it just messes up my day, I've gotta to listen to worship music. I have a tendency to leave the radio on in the car where I'm listening to, you know, to, to the news and all these different things, and if I get, the first thing I'm listening to is Fox News or CNN, when I get in the car, I'm messed up. If the first thing I'm listening to is, is some version of, of secular music, I'm, I'm messed up. For me, I'm speaking for me. I, everything for me is how I start my day. I'm in the presence of God. I, I've gotta be praying. I don't necessarily have to do an hour or even 30 minutes, but I've got to recalibrate my heart and set the tone for the day and say, today is the Lord's day. Today's the Lord's day. Another part of this one is we need to reconnect with God in transition moments throughout your day. One of my friends came in and, and spoke to our staff this week. He's, he um, works in the healthcare system. And he was coming and speaking to our staff about how he balances being a believer in the secular world. And he said, there's so many things I can't say in places. 
but I can be who God's called me to be, and I can prepare my heart and ask God to help me with how I respond to people in meetings, giving me wisdom. He said, there's these moments, these transition moments before meetings and after meetings, important meetings when we're in, um, in the group meetings and discussing how to interpret things for work and all these different things, and he says, I've gotta go in, get alone with God and say, God, every meeting, don't let it just be me. Guide me, shape me, help me be in this meeting what I cannot say in this meeting. Transition moments. I mentioned this a minute ago, but these disciplines, creatively, we gotta get creative with how we worship. Listen to worship music in your car. What if you're like, I don't even know what, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't like Christian radio. Honestly, I don't either. I don't like Christian radio stations, but I love worship music. I, I don't like a lot of like Christian pop. I mean, I like some of it, don't judge me. I, love, I mean, but I love worship music. And if you need examples of that, email the church. We'll, we'll give you tons of, of resources on that. Look up those songs we're singing every Sunday morning. Get them in your heart. Your kid's going to school. They're like, I don't wanna listen to worship music. You're like, I don't care. Mandy listens to worship music every single day when she's taking the kids to school, and it's in them. Our 14-year-old son, Asher, walks around our house singing worship music at the top of his lungs. It would not happen without these small disciplines. We need to express gratitude for the job you have, for the school you have. I hate my job. What's well, better than not having one? Express gratitude. Gratitude is the anthem of worship. Also, begin to consider why God has you where you are right now. Like right now, yeah, here, but I'm talking about in life. Why does God have you where you are? At work, at school, start asking why. Why am I working next to this person? Why am I sitting next to this person in class? Why do I walk by this person every day? Why is this person at, at the coffee shop every time I go? Why is it the same barista every time I drop by? Why? I'll tell you why, because God is crossing your paths with that person to be on mission with God in alignment with being an entire being worshiper. Mind, will, and emotion. You know, I was thinking about this in, when it comes to us being a skilled worshiper, a skilled worshiper, it's kind of like being a skilled sailor. Someone said this, I love it. A sailor can't create the wind, but they are ready for the wind and know what to do when it comes. Being a skilled worshiper, I can't create the presence of God. I can't, I can't create those moments, but what I can do is know what it feels like when it's happening and know what to do in the presence of God, which is worship. I can't control it, but I can enter into it and I can bless God by reminding myself of his place and reminding myself of mine. So what's your next step? Where are you today and where do you need to be? For many of you today, your next step could be, I'm not a disciple yet, I'm not a growing disciple because I've been away from God and I need to give my life to Christ today. Maybe that's your first step. For many of us, it doesn't matter who you are, how long you've been a Christian, everyone has a next step. In all seven of these dimensions, what is yours? What's yours here? What is your next step in Maui? Everyone has a next step when it comes to discipleship. What's yours? I don't want you to forget here and in Maui, you guys received a devotional. This will help you on the way in. If you didn't, get it on the way out. This is something, it's 50 days long, starts tomorrow. If we are dedicated to things like these, these are these practical, creative ways to worship where we can learn new habits in our lives, recalibrate every single day. Our kids um, have resources that they'll be leaving kids ministry with today, and you guys jump into this stuff with your family and watch what God will do. I wanna pray with you today, and if you are in the room today and your next step is to receive Christ as your savior, I'm gonna pray. I'm not even gonna have you raise your hands today or anything like that, but as I pray, I want you to make this prayer your own and receive Christ right where you're sitting today. What he did on the cross for you, receive that. Make this prayer your own today, and let's all take our next step in worship. Father, we thank you so much for this moment, this time we have together with you today. Let, let the word of God sink into our hearts, change us, mold us, renew us, let us all grow 
and become skilled worshipers as we grow and become disciples who make disciples. Jesus, all everyone who today has this posture of receiving you as their Lord and Savior, I just pray right now we acknowledge that we've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But you came, you went to the cross, you died for us, took our place, and all we have to do is call on your name and know you are alive and not dead. You want relationship with us, and we are calling on your name to be our Lord and Savior today. Come into our lives, forgive us, change us, renew us. And in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen, amen, amen.